There is something insanely cool about mini PCs, just taking a small form factor and packing as much power and features into it as humanly possible, especially when you're conscious of your energy bills and you're trying to stay on a low footprint. And today I've got a really exciting one for you. This is the iCool Core R1 Pro. And this has so many features packed into it, I'm actually really excited to take a look at this one and show you what it can do, as well as talk about some of the capabilities. So right off the bat, as soon as we open the box, we have the R1 Pro itself, and you get an idea of just how small this is. Look at that. We'll just set that to the side for one second. Also in the box, we have a power adapter, I'm guessing. Standard USB-C power adapter with some different adapters, so you can use it in different countries. And we also have little accessories. So there is a USB-C to DC power jack, so you could use a different adapter if you wanted to. You could use a standard uh, barrel jack connector. Uh, we've also got some QC stickers and some little screws and mounting hardware. Looks like so you could mount it to the back of like a monitor or something like that. That's pretty cool. And that's about it for the box. Right off the bat, I can tell how dense this is for its size. It's got an all aluminium, aluminum enclosure. Uh, so aluminium all the way around. And yeah, that's so heavy for its size. I wasn't expecting that. Just look how small that is. He's so cute. Use it next to my phone. Wow, yeah, that is so small. But it is a little bit thicker, so it can fit in the I.O. And speaking of I.O, actually, these are Intel 2.5 gig NICs, which is unexpected. I was expecting these to be 1 gig, but these are 2.5 gig NICs. That is super cool. And you get four of them, which, you know what I'm going to say, this is going to be perfect for a firewall application, among other things. We also get a USB-C port for power, like we mentioned. So it's powered all off USB-C. USB-C is so cool. We also get a HDMI port. On the other side, we get another USB Type-C port for data. We also get an SD card slot. We have another two USB 3.0 ports, or maybe 3.1, we need to double check that. And that is it. Also on the side, you can get a glimpse of a heat sink there. So that is a, looks like a copper or all copper heat sink, which we'll take a look at in a second. But yeah, God, this is so cool. It's a super dense. Oh, on the bottom, you can also see there's like some threaded screw holes here. It looks like that would be for like a VESA mount or for mounting to the back of a monitor or maybe to a wall or on the underside of a unit, something like that, as well as some rubber feet. Oh, cool. So this just like pops off. So that's on there with some rubber mounts and then it just pops off. Oh, and you get straight access to the storage underneath. So this is a 128 gig SSD, NVMe SSD. So it's not SATA based, which is really cool. Really easy to upgrade the storage. You just literally pull that off and you're straight in and you got access to your SSD. But let's take this one out and uh, start taking it apart and see, see what's inside. Let me take a look at your insights. I do believe that they have a 128, a 256 and a 512 gigabyte uh, SSD option that you can choose on their website. And you can see the SSD has just got a thermal pad on the top which then looks like it makes contact with the um, with the top of the case here so that it distributes the heat through it, which is a, which is a really nice design. I love that design actually. It's just so easy to get to the SSD and upgrade it if you need to. Four Allen screws to get into it. Maybe there'll be some more hidden ones on the inside. Ooh, this looks good. Oh, sick. Took off that top plate and then this just lifts off like this, so the, the case, and then you're just left with the with the PCB. That is, that's a really clever design. It's so easy to get into. Nice. Oh, what's that? Oh, okay, power button. Wow, that's really cool. That's like a, a double stacked PCB. So it's a two layer PCB um, connected with some ribbon cables over here on the side. So it looks like three of the network ports are handled by the top PCB, and then it looks like storage as well as the processor and the single network card are handled by the bottom PCB. I want to actually take a look at the um, the heatsink and see how they're doing the cooling. Ah, these, these, these feet are like little screws. Do so you just screw them off and then that metal plate comes off? I have to say, this is a really cool, um, you can tell a lot of planning and thought went into this to make it easy to assemble and easy to get into and, and, and take a look. So yeah, I appreciate that. It's not often you see that. Usually they're trying to keep you out and lock you out of everything. So the bottom plate comes off and then we get access into the tiny little fan. It's so cute. 
This is so compact. Like how do they get everything in here into such a tiny footprint? So you can see that copper heat sink on the bottom. I assume this is copper and not just like a anodized finish, but it looks copper to me. That is covering the entire CPU on the bottom as well as it's got like a, a little, what is this, like a 70 mil fan or something close to that. And then we have the main PCB sandwiched in the middle. I can see some like memory chips as well as the battery and, and various other components in there. I mean, should we take the heat sink off and have a look or we should we should take the heat sink off. So I'm just removing these standoffs at the top, which kind of like sandwich it. Oh yeah, she's coming, bud. Oh, okay. I thought those ribbon cables were soldered in because they're like a high speed signal, but they've got these connectors on the bottom. We should be able to remove these standoffs on the bottom, hopefully. Man, I know I keep saying this, but this is a really cool, uh, cool little design. It's really interesting to see how people design things when they've got such a, a small footprint to play with and they don't have much room. And then, and then that gives us access to our processor on the bottom. So I haven't talked about the processor. This is a Intel 6005 or 6005. And this is a four core, four thread CPU with a two gigahertz base and a 3.3 gigahertz boost, 10 watt TDP. Uh, and this was launched in 2021. So fairly recent CPU means we should get all of the IPC improvements and things like that of a modern chip. Remember we looked at the Zima board a few months ago and that had a Intel 40, 3450, which had launched like back in 2016, 2017. And I said during that video that I would like to see an updated version of that CPU because it was like getting a bit dated now. So I guess this is the updated version of that CPU. So really modern or quite modern chip, especially for a low power PC. Over here, we also have our memory package. So this supports 16 gigabytes of RAM. Unfortunately, that is the max and it's non-upgradable, but the CPU itself only supports a maximum of 16 gigs. But unfortunate that you can't upgrade the RAM because I do think that will probably be the limitation of this device is just how much RAM it can have, um, but still, 16 gigs is quite a decent amount to play with, especially for some home lab stuff. While we're putting this back together, let's talk about some of the applications that you could use this for. So, because it is so low power, as well as has quite a bit of CPU power, relative for its size, uh, and it also has a decent amount of memory, as well as it's got the four network ports, making it ideal for something like OpenSense or PFSense uh, or OpenWRT, something like that. But it also makes sense as like a small virtualization host. So something like Proxmox, you could run Home Assistant on this. It's got plenty of power for Home Assistant, but I do think it would be a little bit wasted as just Home Assistant only because it does have quite a bit of power as well as four network cards. Um, but if you use something like Proxmox, you could have a Home Assistant VM as well as a firewall VM as well as Plex and all these other applications. You could load them all on here and see how it performs. I do actually want to do a full video. If you guys are interested, please do let me know down in the comments if you would like a full dedicated review. It's actually really refreshing how easy that was to disassemble. I thought that we were gonna have like glue and like things to keep you out because of its small form factor, but no, really easy. Um, anyone can do that. The fact that the network cards are two and a half gig also is super cool. No. I forgot to put the power button in. Well, I guess I'll put that back in after I finished. Um, and instead of putting the 128 gig storage back in, what I wanna do is I got this one terabyte Sabrent Rocket NVMe drive. This is a Gen 4 NVMe drive, um, but the R1 Pro only takes Gen 3, totally backwards compatible and works completely fine or should work completely fine. It's crazy how small one terabyte is now. Ah, I found the first design flaw. So if you have two network cables plugged in um, like this, then the tabs on the bottom one hit up into the tabs on the first one. It makes it a little bit difficult to, to get out. I just had an oops, I broke it moment because I plugged in the power and nothing was happening. So I had to disassemble it and everything again, but I found out that those two ribbon connectors that connect the top and the bottom PCB are extremely, not fragile, but they have to be clicked in fully and they do pop out very easily. So even though I had them clicked all the way in, even when I was just reassembling it and I folded it back over, they popped out again. So extremely easy to pop out, uh, but put them back in. I also put the power button back in and yeah, just extremely fragile. So just be aware of that if you do disassemble one. 
But I have loaded OpenSense on here and I've got my laptop connected directly through OpenSense now. And what I wanted to do was to do a couple of speed tests. Firstly, with just the internet connection uh, through the R1 Pro, and I want to enable OpenVPN and see how much of a drop, if any, we get through the R1 Pro and see if there is a difference in speed there. Firstly, what I wanna do is run the speed test through the R1 Pro directly, so no laptop. So if we initiate a speed test over on the left and then we watch the graph on the right, you should see that jump up quite a bit. So yeah, peaking up to 941 there. This isn't a perfect test because it's not able to manage the inter internet connection. The way I've got it connected right now is it's going through the rest of my network. Ideally, I would have this plugged directly into the internet connection and it would manage the connection itself and we would get a better indication of speed. But I did just want to see if there was any degradation in the throughput of it. And yeah, looking pretty much on the money. So it's gave us 914 down and 91 up. Uh, this is a one gig down and a 110 up. That's probably exactly what it should be around 915 since there is other devices. Uh, a little bit low on the upload, but maybe there's some devices using it at the moment. So now what I'm gonna do is run the same speed test on the laptop and that's gonna give us an indication if there is any degradation coming through the ports and then back out. Gonna actually make sure that we're using the exact same servers on both. So that was quite a drop off in performance there. We've went from 900 down to 600. Um, similar upload, quite a drop off in performance. I would like to dig in and see why that's happening, maybe in the full review, um, but I didn't expect that to happen. But let's try with VPN on now and see if that makes a difference. Gonna run the exact same speed test again, but this time we're going through the VPN. So we should see if there's any drop off in speed. Uh, and over on the right hand side, if we now add in our VPN connection, you will see that the graphs match exactly. So the the traffic out from the WAN port and the VPN should be pretty much identical, minus a little bit of overhead, which they are, so you'll see that they're tracking together. So WAN and, Va WAN and OpenVPN are using the exact same amount of bandwidth, meaning that all traffic is going through the VPN. We've dropped down to 230 on the download and 40 on the upload. Um, that's a lot lower than I would expect. So we're just gonna run that speed test again, and then over here we have our CPU. So you can see OpenVPN is using 62%. Yeah, 18%. So it's definitely not being pinned and that's only 18% of one core. So it's not the whole CPU. Definitely not running into a CPU bottleneck there. So not sure why the results are so much lower. Just for completeness, we're gonna run the same test on the laptop directly. So going through the cable. So yeah, around 270, 90 up. And let's just double check our temperatures because as you can hear, or maybe you can't hear, the fan is pretty quiet. I can definitely hear it a little bit because it is a smaller fan. I would say the fan from my laptop is about similar volume to the to this fan, so not loud at all. And you can see our temperatures are around 50, yeah, 49, 50, 51 degrees. Um, so pretty cool for its, for its compact size. And that's about it for this video. This is the R1 Pro. Please do let me know if you want me to make a full video on this. I can think of so many applications. I mean, this is like an entire home lab pretty much in the palm of your hand. It's crazy how small computers can be these days. If you want me to do a full video on sort of running an entire home lab on this thing, I think that would be a really cool video. So do let me know down in the comments as well as what else you want to see or what else you want me to see want me to run on it. That would be pretty interesting. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Drop this video a like and get subscribed if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.